Greetings, everybody. It's a pleasure for me to be here and a chance to uh, talk about my work. Um, I've always been involved in some kind of creative endeavor my entire life. And the confusion was just which kind of creative endeavor it was going to be. Um, and mostly circumstances. You know, I planned a lot. And as they say, God laughed and laughed. Um, and <laughs> I just went wherever the uh, energy took me. Um, circumstances, I went to studied art and, and film at, in Montreal and, and creative writing and then went to Europe, England and studied art there as well. But instead found myself having to do um, mostly writing and then that very quickly became a pleasure. It didn't start off that way because I started off running, writing Massey Ferguson tractor ads. And that's not a career path you want to take. Um, in any case, um, I ended up really working in, in writing a lot. And uh, art became an unusual thing for me. Um, once in a while, I ended up teaching art. And so for the last 25 years or so, I taught um, at an art school, an art university called Emily Carr um, University of Art and Design. And I also taught uh, creative writing and um, other kind of interdisciplinary subjects at Langara College. And then finally, um, I took early retirement and just devoted myself to uh, painting. I, I, one of the reasons when I was trying to paint in my off time in my basement and I ended up spilling paint all over the carpet, I said, I can't handle this anymore. So that was it. I just quit. <laughs> Instead of, you know, trying to clean it up, I uh, quit what I was doing there and turned myself to painting. So what I want to do is go through the uh, artwork. I've got s several uh, pieces and as I'm talking about them, I promise not to spend too much time on each one. I'll give you a little bit of background about the painting and about my method and so forth and what that addresses. If anything catches your eye, just make a note of it and we can talk about it afterwards. Um, uh, unless there's something urgent and you want to ask a question um, at that moment. So let's start and uh, with the first one, and that'll give you, and the first one is called Ship of Fools. That's not me. I, I am the fool there, yes, but. <laughs> Where's that Ship of Fools? There it is, Ship of Fools. Um, so basically, even though that's a painting that I did only about, I don't know, six, I guess 2014, something like that. Um, what it addresses is something that I've been in, I guess, in a sense, addressing my entire life. And that's my life as a seeker, seeker of knowledge, seeker of spirituality, seeker of creative expression. And lots of people, I came from that generation where lots of people turned towards seeking. So what you see there, uh, aside from the central sun image, is a conflation, first of all, of... Uh, you know, water and air and earth are all kind of deliberately mixed together and you have boats full of people moving through the sky and some on the ground waving to them because those people who are in those boats are not coming back. They're going off on their journey. Um, no, not ready for this one yet. So, so um, anyway, so um, I, I, in, it's about, 36 by 48 inches this one so it's it's you know i don't know it's fairly large it's quite dominating and uh it has lots and lots of small details in it um so that is one of the themes i guess the idea that art is not just a form of self-expression it's a way a way of knowledge a way of becoming you know so can we move down to the next painting, which is called the, yes, here we go. So the second thing, this is a torn butterfly wing number one, 30 inches by 40 inches. And this was a, a series that I engaged in a, about three or four years ago. And what it represents to me is the drama of beauty being sacrificed in this kind of violent world that we are in. And also 
you know, often on in my life, I've seen butterflies with damaged wings and it's an incredibly painful moment, but it represents so much. Um, it's a tricky thing because it, it's dangerously on the edge of being, uh, for me, kind of overly precious. And I, I really hesitate to get myself involved in anything like that. But at the same time, it's clearly, uh, for me, an emblem of the soul, the wounded soul. And thereby, through the artist, you can see the wing is damaged there. Through the artist, the um, the artist takes in the whatever that material of life is, and she recreates it and expresses it as art. And thereby, for herself and for all of us, there's some kind of uh, potential salvation, potential healing. In fact, I became involved um, early on, oh, about 25, 30 years ago, in art and healing and um, was sat on various committees, was part of the organizing committee for the first ever art and healing conference uh, in Vancouver at, through Simon Fraser University, and then won a Rockefeller grant for art and healing, but mostly to do with themes of water that allowed me to uh, go to New York, and that's a whole bunch of other stories. But that's, that painting, I guess, represents that kind of thing. I guess the drama of beauty, and the uh, acceptance of suffering. Next painting. Next painting, there we go. Ariadne laying down her mazes. Now I'm really fascinated with mythology. One of the things I taught when I taught at interdisciplinary was in the classics area, classics departments. So Greek and Latin studies and so forth. Ariadne, as you know, probably uh, is connected to Theseus and she helped him survive the labyrinth and kill the Minotaur. And then he escaped with her and he abandoned her, you know, because he had supposedly had other things to get onto. And uh, she hung out with um, Dionysus and so forth and her adventures continued. But her story is much larger than that. And she is connected to, because she's, She's the one who came up with the magic thread, the magic rope. She's connected to all kinds of traditions of weaving, rope making, the threads that connect us through the dangerous moments of life. That's what I see. And also with magic as well, if you explore the Mediterranean world. And she's also very seductive, as beauty is seductive. You know, beauty can be seductive, so it can be... Uh, pleasurable seduction, it can be a dangerous seduction, it can lead us. So here she's laying down her mazes in which we can, you know, explore or we can get caught in. So that's, so all my paintings, by the way, are meant to, to entice us to enjoy its surface qualities, but there are always, always several different narratives happening. And if you don't get them, that's fine. You know, I don't believe in uh, kind of, uh, you know, just a single message. That's it. I don't believe in that. So it may be that if one returns to it, one sees something else. And the next one is All Beings Greet Today. Um, 24 by 36. Uh, as you see, I, I mix thing, different things. Like I don't just have acrylic. Acrylic, and then I work with oil stick, and I and I draw with pen, and it's always on. Usually, a, let's say ninety percent of the time, it's on canvas. And here, it's it's fairly clear. Now, this came out of the kind of several experiences I had, where I I went out into the world and I saw, oh my God, everything is alive, and everything is praising God, and everything is you know is it, full of life, except for me. <laughs> I'm not. I felt, you know, especially first thing in the morning and especially in my early 20s, felt like I had been run over by a car and I just failed to take down this license plate. You know, it was just it's horrendous. I said, oh, my God, why do I feel this way? And uh, so I should be praising, you know, and trying to. Uh, but I certainly recognized that uh, that it didn't take much. You just have to go out and 
here where I am, Grace has a wonderful garden that she tends and I can just go out there and everything is alive and welcoming the sacred. So, you know, the fact that it's up to humans to do that. No, we just have to hold up our end. We don't have to do it. We don't even have to welcome. We don't have to even greet today. We can just watch everything else greet the day. So that's that one. The next one is a slightly different. This one is on the darker edge, Bloom Death Eve. It's a smaller painting, 16 by 20. I don't often work in smaller dimensions. And here, Bloom Death Eve, what always I, I have wondered about and caught is that is that day when the first frost comes, the heavier frost, and any blooms that are there get killed by the frost. So it's that edge of beauty and death, life and death. And of course, it's the eve when the blooms will die. So and I had fun with that one because I layered it very carefully. And that's what that's about. That's a theme also that layering and, and working with those kinds of themes of beauty and death and passing, they're all passages um, that um, we engage in. So also the other thing I should say is that, you know, it, it sounds like because I talk talking a lot about ideas and all my work is about ideas, but the ideas are just a part of who I am. I don't think about these things when I, in the studio, you know, I say, oh, maybe I want to do something like that. And then I go in and I look at the canvas and it's a blank mind. It's empty mind and I don't try to fill it and just work with it. And often what happens is I work up to a certain point, not this one, but other things, and uh, I get stuck. So I move on to the next one, and I have often five or six paintings on the go at the same time. You know, and then I come back, and this one was finished all in one kind of occasion, but others, <laughs> one was took about seven months. But luckily, I had other things going. So the next one. Okay, change of plans. You know, I, I like to have a little bit of humor in my paintings occasionally because art can become too serious. You know, that's the problem. And uh, so here it's, we're not quite sure what's going on, but it's certainly not a swimming party. You know, in the background, it's either an explosion or a fire of some kind. The, the ship looks like it's in trouble. And the people who are there in the water all they can do is gaze at it. Their backs are to us and recognize that there's going to be a change of plans. And there's always a change of plans. So this is my take on it. At least they're in the water. Okay, that's it. 30 by 40 inches as well. So that's the usual size, 26, sorry, 24 by 36 or 30 by 40. Um, I've gone quite small sometimes and other times much larger. The next painting is quite complex. This, this was part of a solo show I had of about 20 paintings in Van, you know, Vancouver, Sunshine Coast area in 2015. And it's kind of, it's kind of comp, well, it's complicated or complex. It's based on the idea of bees and a particular um, uh, Bees of the Invisible, which was a phrase from Rilke's poetry. So this is like a beehive, but it's only a symbolic beehive. It's not a literal beehive. In it, you'll see people, when you look carefully, people's faces, head and shoulders, all kinds of things going on, all kinds of movements. And in the upper part, central part, you'll see water and you'll see a swimmer looking at a message that he can't read, read properly and you can't either. Um, because it is, the letters are jumbled. It's like an anagram. And uh, now you're going to try to prove me wrong. I know. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it basically says reality is not what you think it is. Um, it's quite a large painting, 48 inches by 48 inches. All the paintings in that exhibition were that size, um, which meant, meant that I sold very few of them. <laughs> but later on, I, I sold some of them. I'm quite intense, as you can see. And Devo is just Ovid spelled backwards. So he becomes a stand-in for the artist. Devo, I've got a few Devo paintings. 
it's us Ovid. And that's basically it. Um, yeah, I don't, I'm not sure what else to say. I mean, there's a great deal that's factored in there. Um, it would be a lot easier if we were close up, we could see, oh yeah, these people represent this, that, you know, they're there to see what is going on, what is being created. Bees, um, obviously we know the end product, honey and so forth. And in Rilke's poem, honey was something that was made by artists that, to give to the world, that would feed the world spiritually. I don't, I'm not literally interpreter of Rilke in this case. I'm just simply taking that notion. Okay, next painting. This one, a uh, smaller one, 26 by 26. I've got a number of paintings like this, a little more geometrical. Um, called Elements of Steppenwolf Dream Theater. <laughs> you know, it's important to be pretentious once in a while. Uh, some people say, what do you mean just once in a while? Anyway, Steppenwolf is, um, as you know, um, name of Herman Hesse's novel, one of my favorite novels. Um, people, you know, goes way back. People used to read that and Siddhartha and wear beads and smoke a lot of weed and say, I can't wait to go to India. Um, I just read Steppenwolf. And um, so I love that it's it's the it's the um, I guess mid century mid twentieth century version of someone either on a spiritual search or having a, a psychological breakdown one or the other may possibly both I'm interested a lot in theater and dreams Jung and uh, Jung and various other things like that so I put it all together and uh, here is a here as you see the figure there in front and all the various elements that are taken apart and could be put back together again in some other way, other than what I've suggested, uh, like a jigsaw, you know? But there are little theatrical elements and various other things, just as, for instance, all of us are brilliant uh, dramaturges and cinematographers and so forth in our own dreams, right? Um, it doesn't mean we can have boring dreams, but usually we're quite clever at uh, being able to change the scenery and so forth. So this is like an idea that belongs to that. And I've got a few paintings that, I've got actually quite a few paintings. Not I'm not gonna show them to you now, but they exist. If you're interested, you should go to my website. You'll see some more of them there, which is uh, www.romankubicekart.com. Um, next one. Okay, so here, Le Soleil Noir, that's um, the dark sun and, or the black sun. And this idea, again, it's a number of different ideas. Like people look at it. I showed it to one person here who's a curator and he said, oh my God, it's so gorgeous. And this and that and the other thing. Yeah. Um, and other people might look at it and say, oh God, it's decorative. Oh God. You know, and they have to stanch the blood flow from their nostrils because it looks decorative. So you have a, a range of different uh, impressions of it. I'm not afraid of beauty, so it doesn't bother me. But here, the direct reference is to the, to the poet Gerard de Nerval, who uh, was a sort of famous French poet of the mid 19th century. And, um, uh, had was not afraid to show he had he has various kinds of mood disorders and the, the soleil noir refers to uh the i guess the gifts of depression people say gifts you know well he had a you know i think they're the milder ranges of depression offer um certain interesting things definitely and people like the psychologist james hillman or rembrandt the artist would be able to concur with that. So I'm talking about not the psychiatric kind um, that have to be treated with medications, but something else. At the same time, the reason that black sun is so dominant is that it represents um, a certain stage of alchemy, the alchemical process, what we call, or other people call nigredo, which is the descent into the, into the earth, into blackness before the reverse journey can happen. 
So you're not going to go straight to the gold, to the you know section of uh, the session of engaging with gold. You have to go first through the darkness, which we and that represents all the things that we might think it represents, all our flaws, our pain, the things we don't want to think about, and that has to be redeemed before then we can go through albedo and then finally into the golden transformation. So nigredo is, is that, it's always there and it has to be, um, it can't be ignored if one is serious about the whole journey. Jung talks a great deal about that and so do a lot of other people. And you know, it's well known in, in, in the arts as well as, as a stage of something. Um, and then the third thing, is, is it's clear because it looks sort of ominous. And so for me, I uh, wanted to in some way deal with the whole idea of the apocalypse. It's all around us, everywhere. You go on the street and it sort of hangs over us. Even if you're a positive, cheerful person, um, it's there, that kind of thing. And people feel that they have to, you know, save the environment or save themselves or save each other because if we don't, it's over. To be that it doesn't have to be a comet hitting us. That's already signs of the apocalypse. So that, it's, but I'm not a person who feels um, despair or anything like that. So for me, that's just a sign of that we are in the stage of Nigredo before the ultimate transformation. So that's Le Soleil Noir. And if we move on to the next one, I have a series of them. Here's another one. I thought I would include a second to show you. Whoa, that's quite different. Yeah, this is part of that Black Sun series. Black Sun is searching for the new Indies. But it shouldn't be faux, the new Indies. That's okay. Actually, I like that better as a title. <laughs> it should be for the new Indies. Faux, let's keep it faux. <laughs> and uh, I thought, well... This black sun is obvious. Um, the sailboats, I've just got a few, the rest of the boats just drawn in. Why not? Why, you know, waste time trying to. Um... <laughs> and so Paul has just messaged me and, and so forth and everyone else. And so here is uh, Columbus. This, you know, I said, well, I have no idea what he looked like. So I'm just going to put a statue of him there. So I, I've got the statue of him there pointing to. Let's search for the new Indies. <laughs> we need some place new to discover and start over again. But, you know, and that sounds very hopeful and very, very exciting, except the black sun is there over the sky. So got to watch it, right? <laughs> it's, I work with contraries a lot. Uh, in fact, I you know, one of my personal beliefs is, is all creation comes from an appreciation of contraries. Okay, so that's that one. Um, children's games, yeah, just to show you something a little different. I've got some a set of realistic uh, and other, I've got another one, two paintings. And this is sort of a nod towards Bruegel, but Bruegel is, uh, you know, running around the village square. And this one is behind a fence with that figure, um, whatever she is. You know, she's there stumbling along, quite innocent, but I wanted to make it ambiguous. And you can't quite see the children through the fence. And the rest, that's it. I wasn't trying to say anything more. Just have that and this intense kind of orangey color that's in the background. Um, yeah, I apologize that it's not clearer. I can't make it any clearer than that. Um, if, if we put it up really large, we could, but then we wouldn't be able to have a Zoom call. <laughs> so that's the way it is. Um, and it's 24 by 36. Um, so I, this is, I said, one of a set of what I might call realist paintings. Um, uh, but they don't all, you know, they're different things. Some are taken from nature and some are urban based like this one. Um, okay, the next one, we're about halfway there. The Whirling of the Worlds Never Stops. Oh, another pretentious title, excellent. Um, so here we go. Just I start, well, you know, people say, don't you ever do flowers? Okay, okay, I'll give you a flower. 
<laughs> I'll give you a flower, but I couldn't just leave it like that. So I work and I've got all these things with all these circles. So it was, you know, painting would be good if you get rid of these circle things there. Can you get rid of those? But no, those are those are part of the painting very much so. And it's again the conflation of the micro and macro, you know, so they could be, who knows, you know, pollen, it could be pollen, it could be anything, seeds blowing through the air, something that belongs very much to the world of the garden. But, and, and that's, you know, I include that, that's the micro, but the macro is this extraordinary universe that we live in, where you have billions of stars and galaxies all over. Um, and they're there for us to see, but except we only see little pinpoints and we've got the flower that somehow is our most direct access to any of that. We don't have to go farther than that. So, and I firmly believe that. So this is kind of medium sized 26 by 26. I'm very interested in, you know, physics and science and all of those kinds of things. I'm one of those unfortunate people that it's interested in too many things, but anyway. The next one, moving between the worlds. Here I've got, I've got a few paintings where um, there's a, uh, the figuration is a little bit primitive, you know, on purpose. So, but I didn't want to go totally down that road. And in fact, gee, that's one of the, if I have to point out a flaw in my work, I've got too many dif uh, different types of work. And, uh, if you go into the art world, that's a kiss of death. So I always have to be very careful just to show them what's on the menu tonight. And they want to know well, what's on the menu tomorrow. Or, oh, no, I can't show you that for the next day. Just what's on tonight. So I've got a few of these types of paintings. Um, very interested in archery. So I've got someone being blasted <laughs> through the arrow out of that sphere and two figures moving in and out and that's as much as I want to say about that one but it's uh I think this one's about yeah what do you say 36 by 48 that's right so I'm quite proud of this large circle because that was just freehand drawn which uh you know you may say well I, I can do that but 36 by 48 you know try to draw that without falling flat on your face for me anyway for you, probably a piece of cake, but for me, I was proud that I didn't fall flat on my face. Okay, next one. Yes, here's another one. Odin's shield. I thought, well, you know, this is a little bit of a departure. Um, I've never seen Odin's shield. In fact, I've never seen Odin, who, as you know, is the great Norse god, most powerful, I guess the equivalent of Zeus of the, of the, the Greek pantheon. Um, and he had this powerful shield. And so I imagine if he was the most powerful of all the Norse gods, his shield must be quite something. Must be. Uh, and I wanted to do it in such a way that it would be an image of something that would be a protection. <laughs> and also be something that um, would be also, that would be an attraction, both protection and attraction, like a door and also keep out, a keep out sign. Because Odin was also not just a fierce God, but he was a protect, someone who was a protective God as well. Um, but that doesn't mean that I, you know, are in, I'm into Norse mythology. I'm into all mythologies, purely imagistically. That's an eagle on the top. In case it doesn't look that way, you might think, what's that schmata up there? But it's actually an eagle. I think, I hope. <laughs> um, yeah, that was actually it took, it's quite a large, it's 36 by 48. It took quite a long time to do that. Oh yes, I should say that the outer rim um, of the shield, I actually wrote, uh, runes, uh, R-U-N-E-S, the kind of magical um, Nordic writing. Uh, so I wrote them in there. I've forgotten what they mean. <laughs> so, but it's impressive, right? For me, they just remain as marks. I like them as interesting marks. 
Okay, next. I don't take, you know, the other thing you're probably wondering, I don't, I, I really, really love to create paintings, but I don't take any of it too seriously. I don't take anything too seriously. That's the problem, you know, but uh, so, except for the really important stuff. String theory. Some of these paintings, by the way, are sold, like this one, for example, but I, you know, put, put this one up. And so again, flowers, yay. But I've got other things in there. Um, I've got some notes that refer to uh, uh, Beethoven's, you know, um, Ode to Joy. <laughs> yes, there you go. It's in there. And I also have string theory, which is, as you know, um, the great uh, physics, it comes from physics and it's from quantum theory. And it's supposed to describe a number of different things. So I've got some calculations that are in there on one of the petals that are referenced to that. And at the same time, I put in, I didn't just draw in, but I actually put in real thread because it's supposed to be string, right? Theory. So that's a kind of homage to a string crafts and various other things. When I was studying art in England, I was also a part of this group where we did uh, weaving and a number of other things. Um, and so that was, I always found very interesting. And uh, lots of really well-known artists were in, in those days involved in those, th in those kinds of elements as a way of getting beyond the pretensions of what was then abstract expressionism. Although looking back now, we say, oh, wasn't abstract expressionism great, was, you know, <laughs> but then it was something else. So this is string theory. Um, I'm quite proud of this one. I think it worked out very well. And this one is 26 by 26. Don't ask me why 26 by 26, I didn't cut it that way. I bought the canvas and uh, it wasn't 24, it was 26. So that's what it is. Next painting, please. Falling, okay, here's another realistic painting. I don't do many of those. I find them really, really hard. Some people can do it with, you know, with their other hand, their opposite hand and their eyes closed. For me, it takes a very long time. And I've messed up. Some of my realistic paintings have suddenly had a transformation and decided to become abstracts. You know, when I realized that uh, <laughs> it just wasn't gonna work. This looks like a waterfall, but actually it's a very small way I imagine because it's based on a real falling water. It's just small water that happens to be falling, you know, small, whatever you want to call it. It's not a big waterfall, but I like sometimes uh, these small entries into life where you're not sure exactly what, how this, you know, what you're really looking at. Is this something large? Is it vast? Um, so I hope it's, it's dynamism is still there and uh, whatever complex elements were there in the original, they've still been able to preserve it. And that's 24 by 36. And falling water is not easy. <laughs> it's easy to make it look like cotton wool, but not like falling water. Can we move on to the next one? Okay. Balancing lessons. At first I had an image of a skater on ice. You know? And uh, so I, you know, did some, but I wanted to, didn't want to make it too realistic. So then I thought, oh, let's make it something that can represent uh, anybody as they're trying to balance their way through life. Any, take a moment in life and that you will have some balancing lessons that you have to learn. And so that's that one. Um, it's pretty straightforward. Just as you see, there's nothing else to it. It's pretty simple painting, 24 by 30, but it's hanging in my apartment in uh, Gibson's. Um, although it's owned by Grace, but it just, she lets me hang it there. Um, so it's uh, quite something. I think that uh, be able to look at it and say, yeah, it's, it's okay, this painting. This is from about, um, I don't know, six, six years ago, seven years ago. 
Okay, next one. Ah, yes, Hidden in the Forest. This is from a, a couple of years ago. Again, people say, why don't you do more forest paintings, trees? They say, so I do some trees, but again, you know, I muck it up with uh, putting a whole bunch of other elements in there that don't seem realistic. But um, to me, it was, it was fall and I wanted to get that sense of, you know, fall in Eastern Canada is glorious, right? So some of that color, but I also wanted to create the leaves so that they didn't just seem like leaves but they were something else. Those green thingamajigs are, could be leaves, but there's something else clearly, right? And I wanted, to, I need things to be referential to at least three or four do different domains. So uh, this is what I've got going in there. And there's something hidden in the forest. I'm not gonna tell you what it is, but it's there. It's 24 by 36. My stuff is, is about color a lot, and that alarms some people, but I'm un, unapologetic about it. Next one, please. Oh yes, open sesame. Well, there's nothing much, it's pretty straightforward. What can you say? A couple of, a couple standing there in front of this great big humongous wall, trying to say, what is it? Is it? Open caraway seed? Is it open hazelnut? Is it open, what is it? <laughs> One of those is right. <laughs> it's, a, it's called open sesame. So they're just standing there. And um, there's nothing more I can, I, I do want to say about it because even though some of my paintings have a narrative feel like this one, it's not narrative in the sense where there's a beginning, a middle and an ending that is all plotted out. For instance, here we have, we're in the middle of the story, clearly. We have no idea why the couple is stuck in front of this wall. And I'm not gonna tell you what happens. Only you can say what happens afterwards. I'm not even interested in what happens. But if you say, yes, they figured it out and it opens and then, you know, then you can go beyond there. You can do the next paintings after that. So that's 24 by 36. That also hangs in my apartment. Um, next one. Ah, oh, yeah. This is a slightly older one. Uh, 2000, I don't know, 13 maybe. Beyond surrender, there's more surrender. Of course. It can never just be enough, right? There has to be even more surrender. And so that's how it's someone climbing up a ladder and uh, looking around and there's already people surrendering, you know, he, he got there late. And uh, the ladder just keeps on going high and higher and higher. And I just have it and that's sold. So uh, someone, actually someone in Robert's Creek, or, you know, in a place like Robert's Creek and yet someone bought it, right? So. but I was quite pleased with it. There's also a little bit, you know, I mucked it up a bit because I put it deliberately put in some of uh, the math that belongs to the equations of uh, Werner Heisenberg who came up with the uncertainty principle. <laughs> so people look at it and say, well, what is that? You know, and then well, what is that stuff? Someone wrote on your painting. And so I wrote on it, you know, those are the actual equations. Ah, oh, well then you see, you have something to talk about can distract you from the other things. Anyway, that's that. Beyond surrender, there's more surrender. And what else? Next one. Okay, so here, this is a new series, a coming, a new venture that I'm, I'm doing with Adelia, who's there somewhere in the background today, Adelia McWilliam, who's writing poetry. And uh, we got together and we said, let's do something called Terra Poetics. You know, and, and we had the courage to actually use that word in public. We're gonna have a site called Terra Poetics, I think. And so she had wrote a wonderful poem about wolves and she taught me about sea wolves. I had no idea that they existed. For me, wolves I thought were very much in the interior, but apparently there are wolves that are constantly on the beach 
God knows what they're doing. And uh, they live there and their uh, coloration is different. Their sizes are different and so forth. So I became a little bit fascinated with that. And I thought, well, I'm I don't want to put them on the beach because that's, I don't know, that will take me to places that uh, either will be too sentimental or something else. Although I promised, I promised her that I'm going to do more wolf paintings. This one is going, obviously, these three wolves going down a center of a town where there's three storefronts. One, of course, is a laundromat. Um, this is not something from design, you know, design magazine, right? It's, and then there's uh, Captain Cook's Fish and Chips. And that is, well, Captain Cook has a specific meaning among the First Nations people of, uh, of uh, North America. So I just thought I'd put it in there, but I didn't want to take it too far down that road. And then Amor Wine and Beer, which is just a, Amor, of course, as you know, is Latin for love. <laughs> love wine and beer. So we got that, the wine and beer in the window. And going the other way on the, on the, on the uh, middle of the street, are three turtles. So I just thought I would contrast them with that. It's easier when you see it in the flesh. And that's that. Uh, it works better when there's the poem, I guess, but this is not bad. It's 24 by 36. So we've I've done a, a few paintings with her and we hope that this, um, I, uh, working together, this partnership is gonna come up with all kinds of interesting stuff. Um, and because I love poetry, you know, so I thought, well, I, I love to work with others. I love collaboration, but it's hard. I don't want to, I'm not going to share my canvas with someone else. Okay, I'll do the bottom, you do the top. No, forget that. So, um, you know, but some other way, definitely. Yes, we'll have a launch. Adelia is saying we'll have a launch website soon. Not a lunch, a launch. Yeah. Okay, got that. Um, and the next one. Okay, this is a biggie. 44 foot by six foot painting. It's called 10,000 Eyes. And you know what? <laughs> I counted them. There are 10,000. Okay, I lied. There are 10,003 because I didn't want to be thought of as OCD. So I put in three more, right? And I put them there all. And what it ref references is um, the mesopelagic zone of the ocean, which starts at 200 meters and goes down to a thousand meters. So from 200 meters to a thousand meters depth, which is incredibly deep because we're not talking feet, we're talking meters. And it's almost no light reaches there. Um, what happened, and very few creatures, you know, there's some, there's, uh, I think the sperm whale visits, there are various kinds of monstrous looking fish, and um, there are jellyfish and a few other things like that. And there are these bioluminescent creatures that the fish and other things feed on, and that create some of the light. So I thought I would show these bioluminescent single-celled creatures, you know, uh, so by. And what it references aside from that sense of, wow, what an amazing thing. Here we have the planet mostly covered with ocean and there deep, deep down, we have all of this life that we don't know about. And it's, it's beautiful and wondrous. It's also the collective unconscious. So I've actually made a pitch for a, a show somewhere where I'm gonna use some of these paintings to present that concept, not only of, of um, the uh, mesopelagic zone, but of the collective unconscious. I mean, what lives in our collective unconscious? You know, it's hard to, hard to tell. And of course, you know, there are lots of things from mythology and as well as the concept of the, um, what is it, is it the 10,000 things of, of Taoism, which is a reference to the universe. It's another way of saying the universe, but of course, what the Taoists mean by it is not the collective notion in, which is in, uh, in the word universe, but the universe as a collection of specific objects. 
including people. They're all specific. So the 10,000 things in Taoism is the universe. This is the 10,000 eyes all watching. Four feet by six feet. What would it look like in your place? <laughs> it's unsold. <laughs> Next one, please. Okay, this is part of that. I posted this recently. Part of that same series I'm, I'm working on now, mesopelagic. So as I said, is that series. And, you know, it's 36 by 24. So 36 depth, the sense of going down, down, down. And, uh, you know, how, how far can you go down? Well, it's not the bottom of the ocean. It's only the mesopelagic. So there is still depth below that. So I want to, and also some kind of light that comes through other forms of bioluminescence that's there. Uh, at the same time, I had certain kinds of uh, Pythagorean symbols in there to, or um, platonic solids and so forth to evoke the sense of the unconscious, just little, little marks, little glyphs here and there. But yeah, if you look at it, up close in the flesh, I think you see a lot more than on a slide always. And that's fine, you know, as far as I'm concerned, I don't see that as a flaw. I want it to be seen from different viewpoints, you know, from a distance, midpoint and right up close. And each time you're gonna see something different. Next. Okay, this one I just posted, whale songs. Um, so again, you know, the idea that there are some whale whales that travel through. And so instead of, I'm not going to paint in the whale, I refuse to do that. So I painted the songs. Well, how are you painting the songs? Well, you tell me. So I put that in there and I called it whale songs. It's still the mesopelagic zone. And actually the idea for it came from Adelia when she, <clears throat> um, she suggested, she told me about the fact that whales um, and their songs have been recorded from deep. And I said, well, maybe I'll put that. I love the idea of a completely different medium. And um, I'm working on now a concept of something a lot more immersive with paintings, music, uh, whatever, you know, all kinds of stuff that could be presented. And it's a completely immersive, but this is it so far. So we actually did it. We went through all of the paintings. <laughs> Paul, you still with us? <laughs> I'm here. And okay. um, in the painting of Odin's shield, yeah. you had um, the rune called Raido in the bottom right hand corner, which I took as sort of a signature since Raman starts with <laughs> R and Raido looks like an R. So I put the cryptic comment Raman yes, equals Raido. And I, um, I happened to draw that rune today, which is interesting, although I drew it in reverse, which might explain some things. Um, but uh, <laughs> you said you don't know much about the rune. So were you just putting it, are there, or did you know that that rune had a specific uh, sort of I uh, put message? some. I, I put some runes there that for me had specific intent, but um, because I'm not that much, I'm, I'm into the concept of, of a mark making that has a significance or magic mark making, but runes specifically, no. I know there are people that swear by it and they belong to rune societies and all that kind of stuff. No, I'm, I'm not, I don't have time for stuff like that. But the idea of, of, for me, there are marks that you can make that communicate in a very special way. So that's good enough for me. Yeah, the meaning um, I had handy because I pulled it this morning, so I put it in the chat. The other question I had was um, your attraction to seriality. First of all, I also wanted to say what a what a beautiful thing it is to be giving given that kind of a tour to your work. So it's really a blessing. Oh, thank you, Paul. And, uh, some really brilliant work in there. So I wanted to preface everything by saying that, which I didn't. However, I yeah. got it done. But so your attraction to seriality, um, I think, is really interesting to me and i'd like to hear from you what attracts you to that mode and maybe who are some of your heroes who've employed that mode in the art world um i'm not sure what you mean by seriality you mean we're working in series you mean yeah well i think all artists work in series when they're exploring an idea 
all professional artists do that. Uh, the problem is, is, is that I move from mode to mode. A lot of the people just stay in one, you know, with one theme for 20 years and I move. I've got four or five different themes. So, uh, I'm, you know, I like that, but I, before the series is finished, I'll move to another one and then another one. <laughs> So I'm working on maybe four or five, six series at the same time. And I move back to the first one. So that may not be cool, but that's what I do. Thank you, Paul. Rohana, you wanted to say something? Uh, hi, Ramon. I am so very nice to have met you and to have seen your work. I am very impressed and I, I, I love it. Oh, my, my favorite one is uh, the thousand eyes. Mm -hmm. By the way, I took pictures of your work so I can study because <laughs> sure. I, I never went to art school and yeah. I have painted and now I'm in some sort of transition. Hopefully I can yeah. begin again. You could go but, to my website. You might get better view. Oh, okay, great. Thank you. I'm, I mean, I... I love it. I just absolutely love your work. And God willing, I mean, I understand about big pieces because I paint big pieces and I paint it on wood, which are very difficult to transport. And then yeah. now I'm thinking of going on small pieces to, that are yeah. just easy to sell. Yes. Not that I need yeah. to sell anything because, no. you know, art is art. But as far as your work, I'm, I'm totally impressed. Yeah, well, in, thank you. In this of course, you should be eyes, impressed. <laughs> you know what I think about this thousand eyes? I think it yeah. is a string theory. 10,000 eyes, not 1,000. 10,000. 10, oh, well, yeah. 10,000. <laughs> so in my stories, I have seen the string attached to a ball and then again to another. Like in a necklace, yeah. you have a pearl and yes. a string, a pearl yes. and a string. And string. Yes. And the meaning was that each one of those spirals is a life. Mm. So we have one string attached to one life and then to the next and then to the next. Uh, and that is the string theory in my... That's interesting because I'm working on a painting now called The Mysterious Pearl. Mm. Um, that's exactly what I'm working on. So I'm just uh, composing it. So that's interesting. Yeah, I, I, uh, thank you for that. You're welcome, and thank you, I, and I, I hope I can get to see more of you. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, yes. Adrienne, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I just had my hand on my head, but I do want to say... Oh, sorry. <laughs> You're holding your head. No, um, the, my problem is I've got too much to say, as always, so I don't quite know where to start, except that what's fascinated me tonight is as you've intellectualized, if you like, your painting... Yeah my interest kind of fizzled because I find your paintings so impactful. They hit me literally physically mm -hmm. like, wow. And I'm, I don't really want to know what they're about because mm -hmm. I'll figure out what they're about to me in time. Sure. So, sure. so I loved that, that, that discovery. And, um, I love the fact, you know, you, you said several times, oh, people say, why don't you paint flowers? And for me, that's deeply uninteresting. So to paint flowers that then also have symbols and, and bits, mm -hmm. you know, whatever, that's interesting to me. Sure. So the fact that you will take a, a realistic idea about a realistic object and still transcend it and transform it into something else, that's... That's fascinating. And the only question also I'm left with is how you get the, that intensity of color. Very often it's the color that leaps out at you. I love the black sun and I don't see the black sun as a negative thing. I think it's like wildly exciting and very positive and I kind of want to dive That's in. Great. But um, is it just that you layer because you clearly have got so much detail and layering, but is that how you get that intensity of color? Uh, it depends. I mean, it depends what colors they decide to work with. Yeah. I mean, you, you uh, can, it's, I'm someone who believes that each color has a role to play. So I don't, I don't want to muddy it, you know, yeah. at all. I mean, I have sometimes done monochromatic work, but 
if I want to dramatize a specific color, then I'm very careful to make sure that my edges, and one way of doing that is I'll work with acrylic and oil simultaneously, obviously not on the same spot, but one area of the painting is an oil, one area is an acrylic. So, and can I just say, what, what do you mean by oil stick? Is that what we, I'm in England, by the way, I'm in Brighton, yeah. we call oil pastel, or is it something I haven't heard of? It's a little different. Oil pastel is, um, is soft. Oil stick is harder and it's a little thicker, but it's not oil bar, which is really thick. Okay. So you can get them. It's hard to get them, but it's something that's a little more narrow and, and a little more pointed. And uh, so you can draw with it somewhat, but it's oil. Basically, that's what it is. That's brilliant. I'll let someone else have a go, but thank you sure. so much. Your work is, is you. really brilliant. It really impacts me. Cheers. Thank you, Adrian. Myself. Anybody else? Oh, yeah. Okay. I just wanted to comment on what I liked. So okay. I love the I love the intensity of the colors. I mean, oh, that great. was just I love that. I think it was wonderful. And then um, I really like this one, The Whirling of the Worlds, oh, yeah. Never Stops. Yeah. And to me, it looked like Batik. Hey, oh, okay. I think, yeah. I think I that's know, I, the yeah. one that looked, looked like a Batik. And I, I thought, really, well, really uh, very beautiful. And, and I mean, it, I liked all of them. So okay. it's like, you know, who's your favorite child? But anyway. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. And I also like Hidden in the Forest of Light. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I loved I loved it. And um, it was interesting to me. I did want to ask you because uh, I paint a little bit, you know, like 10 years. Mm -hmm. I'm an amateur and stuff like that. But I never think of these things that you're thinking of when you're painting. Well, I mean, are I you like actually it. thinking of those things no. when you actually paint? No, I think about them before I paint. In other words, not, not the moment before, but the day before, I okay. think, wouldn't it be neat to do something where I make references to the natural world, but also to the macro world at the same time? And, I, and often it, it's sparked by a specific image. You know, it might be a plant or whatever it is. You know, I, I take photographs of things, street scenes or whatever, a puddle. And I see images in the puddle and so forth. <laughs> right. But instead of wanting to, to paint the puddle, I'll say, okay, so now, you know, that interesting. And because I, I have a lot of background in uh, mainly through teaching, you know, I taught in, yeah. um, in a lot of different areas, classics, literature, fine art, yeah. you know, design theory, uh, f film theory, a, a lot of different areas for many years. So ideas is not a problem. It's there. But yeah. I'm lucky that when I go into the studio, I'm blank. Sometimes, you know, it's terrifying because I'm blank. And I say, oh, shit, you know, nothing's going to work here. You know, I'm not going to do anything. So I just I just see where my hand takes me. And a couple of times mm -hmm. that's worked out well. Yeah. I just draw, you know, and that's worked out well. So well, but what about I don't the black have. sun? What about the black sun? Well, that was the poem. That was a poem by ne de Nerval, and I, I happened to be reading it. God, I don't even know why I was reading it. You know, I'm, it's not like I, but I, I read it and I said, "Wow!" I said, "You know what?" I soon, soon right away. I often poetry does that. I saw a painting, right away, and then I said, so I wrote my impressions in my notebook, and uh, I said, "You know, I got to do a series on this. I don't want to just do one." painting of yeah. this but because to me it's such a rich concept i'm not interested in doom and gloom but doom and gloom may be a small part of the entire picture you know and so it's all about transformation where we can go that's really what it, it's about poor D N nerval he you know ended up committing suicide so he was obviously on the spectrum he was much more seriously ill but i do think that there are ranges of melancholy that are not necessarily, you know, what you call a terrible medical issue. There are people, and James Hillman, who no doubt many of you have heard of, that yeah. talks about that. 
he talks about it. It's the fact you can work with it and not to be frightened by it. Some people are frozen by it, but others have learned to work with it. Poets, you know, and writers. Yeah, religious really, writers, religious terrible. writers, you know. Yeah, they know religious how to write. Oh, yes. Religious Saint writers. John the yeah. Cross. Okay. Yeah. There you go. Very important. Yeah, yeah. Um, Rohana and then Andrew, I think, yeah. A little short note about the, the Black Sun. Yeah. In deep Hindu and Sufis, uh, the Black Sun is also called the Midnight Sun. And it is actually the state that we go in when we do Latihan. Because okay. it does not, it's not a sun that shines, but right. it is a sun of a different light. And some mm -hmm. of us have been able to assess the other light. Like right. it's not the normal light, but it is light and it's different light. Mm -hmm. So there are enormous amount of information in the midnight sun okay. as the deepest of the states before realization. Hmm. Okay. Wow. Yeah, so okay. It is so. a very spiritual state, even though it might be considered as something else. Thank you. Well, I was unaware of that. So thank you very much. Andrew. Um, so for me, it's really personal because <laughs> it's like I'm, <laughs> I, only, okay. I knew you for decades and I knew you as a writer, well, a, yeah. teacher, a, a, a teacher and a writer. Um, and so now I'm looking at this huge, massive work. You're so prolific. And uh, I had no idea. I mean, I, I knew it because I heard about it, but I mean, I'm not on Facebook, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, so how wonderful and how interesting. I, I just feel like it's a whole other part of you that I just didn't know existed. Yeah. But I really like Devo's vision. I like all of them, but yeah. Devo's vision. And it's interesting because I heard that if you actually listen to the sound, if you're able to hear the sound of the universe, it sounds like buzzing bees. Mm, that's nice. It, that's it sounds like what? Buzzing bees. Sounds like what? Oh, it's bees. Yeah, right. Like, like sound I, of the universe. People yeah. who have actually yeah. transcended and talked about the vibration of the universe, that that's the sound that they say it's most like. So it, it sort of mm -hmm. had another meaning for me. But So thank you. Yeah. yeah. That's well, thank you. Yeah, that's, those paintings uh, of which that is a part were all very intense in color and very detailed mm -hmm. and so forth. Um, at the time, I was keeping bees on the property I was living at, so mm. that was uh, uh, an experience that was fed by that too. Um, and I just, yeah, just the whole idea. Um, I had this interesting story attached to it because here I was poetically and artistically interested, you know, in bees and what they bring and everything else. So I said, I'm going to eat some of this raw honey that's from my own hives, you know. So I <laughs> ate the raw honey, and I had a huge allergic reaction. My face just completely <laughs> swelled up and I could barely breathe and everything else. And I was so depressed by that. I wasn't alarmed by the allergic reaction, but I was depressed by the fact that, you know, these bees that I said, oh God, I was part of this, that they would give me an allergic reaction to it. I said, oh, great. I guess I'll have to have craft honey. <laughs> or something, you know, something like that, rather than the real stuff. Mm. But um, yeah, thank you. The, yeah, I've heard something like that before, the sound of bees. And uh, when we get into deep meditative states or states of quiet, I don't use the word meditative in a technical sense, deep, you can sometimes, uh, and you hear something like that. And um, I'm not sure when I've heard it before, whether, oh, I'm in a deep state, or maybe my sense of hearing is going. You know, it's one or the other. Tinnitus, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> I could have, yeah. yeah. Had I, you know, for, I had a lot of paintings uh, to that theme, so I do take it seriously. Yeah, Andrew. Hi, uh, Ramon. Uh, wonderful presentation. Um, your your sense of humor is 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 wonderful and uh, and endearing. Um, I personally, I I really well. A lot of them I like. The, the one of the trees, looking into this with these vivid colors and right. other worldly elements, and so I found particularly entrancing. 
And in terms of your comments, um, as Eliora pointed out, decorative is apparently a dirty word in the art world. Yeah. Um, which I didn't know. And also apparently from something you said, uh, if you go to a gallery, they don't want to see that you have a wide range of uh, styles and so on. They want to see a little more consistency. Yes. Something. Absolutely. Yes. And I, so what, yeah. uh, I'm sorry, I didn't know that. That's uh, amazing yeah. to me. Uh, I don't get it. Um, well, I, the problem is, is it's this kind of, it's what, who I am, you know, I, I'm instead of maybe, maybe I don't go very deep, but I go wide. You know, <laughs> so I all of all of those sorts of things. I try different. I can't help it. I try different styles and so forth. So to to go against that, when I'm on my website, if you go there, you'll see a lot of different kinds of work and a lot of different series. But I'm starting. I will choose if I make a presentation to a gallery, two of the series, just that, and I'll show them, and there'll be a consistency in those two. This is a series and not anything else. And I'll say, if you want to see, I do lots of other kinds of work. They can go to my uh, website, but I show them separately uh, two series. Otherwise, they get nosebleeds. <laughs> oh, Lydia, go ahead and unmute yourself. Okay, I'm unmuted now. Mm. Right. Okay, I, I don't even know where to begin with such a staggering... Uh, <laughs> array of, of images. Um, I'm really interested in how you've connected your art to literary works. And some of these literary works are ones that I always wanted to read and never got around to it somehow. And it just occurs to me that if ever there could be a, a publication of some form with just you talking about uh, Gerard de Naval, for example, and then just as you chatted about how it worked its way into some of your art, it would seem that your art has worked its way into the poetry too and could kind of illuminate the meaning of the poems. So I would just love to see something uh, that you got into, you know, like the bees of the invisible and whatnot. We just went on a great bee thing today. I yeah. loved every yeah. minute of where we yeah. took that. And uh, uh, did you know that recently there was some galaxy out there that apparently has been sending signals uh, that are being picked up and the signals are in the form of a hum? Mm. So it could be music or poetry, right? Well, yeah. <laughs> yes, but I mean, it's interesting to put the two of them yeah. because one yeah. of them really illuminates the other. And yes. uh, I, I just, I mean, I love literature, but I don't know uh, a lot of these, this stuff, Gerard de Naval and Rilke, I've wanted to read and I've read a little bit of, but mm -hmm. what you do with Rilke, it's fantastic. <laughs> so those are my comments. Thank you. Well, I'm very lucky to be able to work with Adelia and she's writing poetry, um, you know, in specific response to some paintings I have. So we're working together and I do paintings in specific response to, um, to, to so I posted a, a painting, which I had done before. I posted a painting just uh, yesterday, I think. Today's Monday, yeah, Sunday, yeah. It's called Among the Fallen, which is a gigantic tree in a forest. And it's done quite realistically. And then I have two stanzas of her, one of her poems um, towards you know, the, the end of one of her poems, which also cites Gary Snyder, who is an extraordinary poet. Mm -hmm. So that's a way that uh, work. And I've also worked with Rasuna Marsden before. And uh, she has a book that she's trying to get out and I've got some images in that. And so, you know, I'm happy. I love to work with... Uh, Poetry has always been something, and um, I used to write poetry, but don't ask me to, you know, to show you. But uh, <laughs> it was part of um, what um, what I did a long time ago, as well as writing literature and you know studying. It was all about engaging, you know. I, I think in the mini um, version that we did with Andrew before, I talked about. Uh, my sense, even when I was a ch very young child, and you know, 13, 14, was somehow connecting the visible to the invisible, and that things would come out of the invisible and become visible. 
and some things that were visible became invisible. So the easiest way of seeing that would be patterns. You see something that's a leaf, that's very visible. But then you look deeper into it, it's a pattern. And if you keep looking, that will, will suddenly become invisible because what it takes you somewhere else. So lots of things like that. Um, you know, so uh, I remember reading the Old Testament um, when I was a kid, but not, I, you know, I couldn't make head or tail of, this, of the thing. They seem like written by people who are sadists or something like that. But, but I loved I was, I guess, a sadist myself because I loved the uh, illustrations by Gustave Doré uh, of all these angels smoting people, constantly thousands of people being slaughtered by angels with swords. I said, wow, <laughs> now this is, now we're talking <laughs> and all these magnificent um, ladders going to heaven and all kinds of other things. And they were not explicated, thankfully. So they just left me with... Um, a lot of imagery. And so poetry does that too. Poetry, when it's really good, leaves you with an image that's not explicated. Did, did you get some influence from William Blake? Oh, I love Blake, of course. Absolutely. One of the courses I studied at university and, uh, and then I ended up, I taught classes in poetry and Blake was you know, central to them. So yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, what is your website so that I can just write it down? My website is www.ramonkubitschek. So it's R-A-M-O-N-K-U-B-I-C-E-K. -E That's my name, right? All one. Art, Ramon Kubitschek Art, dot com. Okay. All right. Okay. I liked all, all of it. It was very, very interesting. I especially appreciated the Bloom Death. Uh, Bloom Sorry, the what? The, oh, the Bloom Death Eve. Yeah. Yes. Yes. That one to me is, is very, very special. I showed that at Stupid Hall for um, a week oh, or yeah? two. Yeah, in Montreal. Yeah. That was oh. part of a small show I had there. Yeah. Okay, I, I don't think I saw it. I saw some of your paintings at the Sewood Group, but I don't remember seeing that one. It's that small. one to me is very, very special. How, what's the size of that one? That one is uh, 14 by 20, 14 inches by 20 inches. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, so the size of a laptop, yeah? Okay. Yeah, basically, yeah. Oh, well, I would, anyway, thank you so much. I guess that's, uh, that's it, Ramon. Do you have some right. final parting words for everybody? Um, well, I, I really enjoyed this. Uh, for me, it was just, you know, offering like a single grape. There's a lot more grapes. <laughs> so I've got a lot more that I could do or show or whatever. It's just, uh, you know, it has to be the right venue. And this was a good venue for doing something like this. Um, I, I, you know, hope to be able to present it in another way at some other time, not as something where I'm involved, but just the work itself, you know, in film form or something else. But thank you so much for, for you know, bearing with me and also for uh, being so good about my work. I enjoyed it and some of your uh, interpretations, definitely. I enjoyed them. So thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. It was our privilege to, to hear from you today and to see uh, um, the word that comes to mind is fecund. You're a fecund. Uh, uh, uh oh. Am I fecund? Oh my God. <laughs> Can I use that word in public? Fecund. You're fecund in public. Fecund. <laughs>